Hi there. Uh, so this talk is about integration and contract testing and uh, its potential for API development and maintenance. Uh, my name is John Roach. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer in American Greetings. Uh, this slide show I'm going to show uh, is going to be on uh, my website, so uh, feel free to pick it up from there. And uh, I hope to also post, like, give a link to it on, from my Twitter, and that's my Twitter, Twitter handle. Uh, feel free to go there or follow stuff. Uh, so, okay, so everything starts with a story, right? Uh, the story is very simple. Uh, we had this one team that, you know, uh, was working on a zoo application, you must say. And uh, so what they, were, they had monoliths and they said, okay, let's, let's, let's you know, let's change this. We, we you know, we need to, uh, we need to take a different approach uh, for certain reasons, who knows. Uh, but, the, but the main thing is that they wanted to go with a more, with more modern architecture, you might say, uh, with microservices. So they separated, separated out uh, these um, concerns and then they create these small APIs uh, and here, the, there's a zoo API and there's an animals API. And uh, so the team had productive meetings. Uh, they discussed and nailed down uh, the communication between these services, what's the requirements. Uh, they did some documentation. They create these end-to-end -end tests uh, to you know, cover the you know, happy paths. And uh, you know, they went on to their merry way. Uh, so the developer life cycle looked like something like this. Uh, so the developer, when a new developer came in, they sat down, uh, read some docs on how to develop their AP, uh, respective API for their team. Uh, if they're on the Zoo API team, they'll be working on the Zoo API team and they'll read Zoo API documentation. Uh, and then they'll update the test if they're doing TDD. Uh, sometimes that's reversed, but eh, it happens. Uh, so they first update the test, they write the code, and they run the test. You know. So all was well. <laughs> uh, well, the thing is that something broke uh, in production. And uh, you know, the zoo app failed. Uh, zookeepers no longer knew which animals win which pens. <laughs> you know, tigers, they didn't know even if, like how many tigers they had in a pen. So it kind of went crazy. And they needed to do a rollback of the deployments. And you know, they went to a better state. Um, so you know, let's, let's go over a little bit what happened. Uh, so, uh, so I said like each, each application, uh, each API developer, would uh, you know be more uh, concentrating on their uh, API? So like Bob from here from Zoo API would actually just concentrate on the Zoo API. Uh, he would only update his own test. Uh, he would update his own code, and he would run the tests for his API. Uh, and same thing with John. Uh, he worked on the Animals API. Uh, he only read the documents for the Animals API, and uh, he ran the tests for that and code for that and whatnot. Uh, so the change they actually found, the, the error they found is actually very, very simple. Uh, someone changed uh, the status from no to false because it made more sense programmatically, right? Why would you use a no string uh, instead of a false string? So, <laughs> so uh, you know, something broke. Uh, and then they had a retrospective, like every good, you know, agile team. Uh, they sat down and said, okay, well, how can we avoid this in the future? So they talked about some good stuff they did uh, for this, you know, uh, that could have avoided this problem. And also they talked about, okay, what can we do a little bit better? Uh, so some of the things they you know, talked about is they say, okay, actually we do have good documentation, right? We, do, right? we have extensive documentation here. Uh, and then um, regarding the APIs, right? They, they, had, they, they did specify that they had good documentation for the APIs. Uh, they said, well, we actually write, you know, we write a test for the API. So each a API would actually have its own unit tests, which is pretty awesome. Uh, we like tests. And then uh, they did talk about end-to-end -end tests, and they, they kind of, you know, worried because end-to-end -end tests only covered happy, happy paths. And there was a reason for that, because basically the end-to-end -end test took a long time. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit more, uh, but, you know, that's, that's the reason why they kind of limited all their end to end tests to the happy paths, because it, to the, if they include everything, it would take too much time. Uh, and they said, okay, we have good daily stand ups, but you know, no one really talked about this change. No one really communicated that, so it got missed, which, which happens. Uh, and then some people said, hey, we have code reviews. Why wasn't this caught in code reviews? Well, code reviews is actually not a tool for communication. I mean, it is a tool to review your code, but it doesn't mean that you're documenting that ch change. It doesn't mean that you're actually communicating that out. There might be someone that might have missed that code review, especially with large teams across multiple API teams, especially if you're a little siloed. Uh, that might get missed. Uh, so it looks like no one actually caught this change, which is, you know, which happens. Uh, so they thought about, okay, what might be the possible solutions? Uh, so they went over a couple uh, options here. They said, okay, let's write more end-to-end -end tests. Uh, it, 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 
I mean, it does make sense. I mean, you might start, right, instead of getting only the happy paths, you might actually start, you know, getting to these edge cases and writing those. But it, again, you're, you're talking about uh, these long taking te te these tests that take a long time. Uh, and I said, as before, I'll get more information, get more into end-to-end -end tests later. And then they say, okay, let's do, write more documentation. Let's actually, you know, add more stuff. But the thing they noticed that is that their actually documentation was almost like 200 pages long. And uh, it actually it was a couple of levels deep. <laughs> so after a while, like the new, any new developer that came in was actually missing some stuff. They were actually have to drill down to all these, uh, you know, long written, long winded documentation about how an application works, and you know things got missed. Uh, so, but still, you know, it doesn't mean that they cannot write it clearer, right? So uh, that was come came out retrospective, and they said, okay, let's do more meetings, right? Uh, more meetings definitely helps. It's all solution to all. Uh, <laughs> Well, a lot of cries said, no, please don't do that because we have enough meetings. So uh, that kind of that kind of died down. Uh, that, that idea kind of got thrown out of the window. Uh, so, okay, so the question is, okay, what, what, what can we do? Well, how can we avoid this problem? Uh, and, and so whatever solution that comes out uh, was decided that we need a solution that facilitates communication for changes that will affect communication between the services, right? So any... any if the, if the communication between the services changes, we need to capture that as soon as possible. And uh, they came up with three bullet points, right? Uh, which should be captured with the solution. The first one is misunderstandings from the consumer about endpoints or the payload. The second thing is breaking changes from by the provider on the endpoints or payload and bugs in the consumer, right? So these are the three main things that we would like to capture. A solution that will capture only these with minimum uh, effort, with Faster time time response, right? You don't want to lose too much time in your test. Uh, you want to, you know, fast feedback as soon as possible. So, let's see, right? What can that be? Uh, so, I want to show you a little bit overview about automation, uh, test automation, and this is actually belongs to Martin Fowler. Uh, he actually, you know, does awesome writings. I definitely suggest you to read them and find them online. Uh, he has cool stuff. Uh, so, I really like this graph because it actually it does summarize the whole test. And, and what types of tests you can do. Uh, so there's like unit tests is very you know limited to uh, these small uh, components. Uh, so like repositories, domain, and you have your integration tests that actually include uh, you know some sort you know two uh, two or three nodes that you might need to uh, integrate and test. But please do know that you actually require both of them. Uh, so you have your component tests. Uh, you cannot actually do this all the time. You know especially if your code is um, highly integrated, it was hard to separate out, uh, you know, some of these components out. Uh, but you know, still, that's a, that's a solution too if you if you wrote your code a little smartly. Uh, but then uh, I, I really, and then there's an end-to-end -end test that is like capturing all of the frame and includes all of these, right? Uh, however, uh, here contract tests is like this small portion here, right? So what the contract test, test does is that it actually verifies uh, interactions at the boundary. Uh, of an external service, okay? So it doesn't require actually the live HTTP client to be there. It doesn't, uh, it's not, you don't require a sub client or anything like that. Um, so it's, it's pretty nifty in that way. So let's go over our requirements again, right? If, if it's only on that boundary, uh, you can actually definitely capture misunderstandings from the consumer about end, end, pain, uh, end points and or payload. Uh, breaking changes by the provider on end points and payload and bugs in the consumer. So it actually, that 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 type of test would actually cover that all, so it's a it's a kind of good solution there. Uh, I talked about some terminologies here. Uh, it kind of might have caused some confusion. It definitely caused for, for me when I first read, read about this. Uh, so uh, you have consumer, which is a component that initiates a HTTP request to another component. So it's actually the initiator. Uh, we're not worried here about what type of method is being used. It could be a get, a post, a put, whatever. Or, uh, but basically, it's the initiator of the, of the request. Uh, and then you have a, a provider, a server that responds to an HTTP request from another component. And then you have a contract, which I'm going to you know, talk about a little more. And the contract is a collection of agreements between a client, a consumer, and, and the API, the provider, that describes the interactions that take place between them. So uh, let's, okay, let's think about okay, how can we set up a, a contract-based test. Now we know some terminologies. Uh, now we know uh, basically you know what the boundaries of this test is going to be, and what do we require for that, right? Uh, so we have two points, right? Two two steps. The first one is defining consumer expectations, saying that hey, 
this consumer is going to require blog type you know, data and you know, given a main example and verify expectations on the provider. Okay. Uh, so there's a couple tools out there, cool tool out there. Uh, I definitely I'll, I have links at the end that will uh, put it out there, but uh, there's a cool tool that's been out there for some time called Pax.io, and they've been working on a Python version of this uh, that you know is, is pretty neat. And uh, so ba Pax.io basically uh, provides a mock service. Uh, you know, it's a tool that guarantees basically contracts are satisfied, right? So when you, once you create the contract, you can uh, you know check that out, and uh, enable co enables consumer-driven contract testing, uh, providing mock servers and a DSL. Uh, you can you know, and then I'm gonna go a little more. So, <laughs> so this is a uh, creating a pack contract is actually uh, the same step that I just mentioned uh, for creating a uh, contract test. Uh, basically, you um, create a test on the consumer side that declares the expectations, right? We talked about expectations here, so you define those expectations. And then you create a provider state that allows the contract to pass when replayed against, replayed against the provider. Uh, some, I have some code examples here. So let's go over that very quickly. Uh, a second. <laughs> so, there's some code here, but the most important portion, of course, is this, is this line here. You're basically defining the, uh, the consumer and the provider objects here. And uh, so once you just define them, uh, you can actually uh, simply define a pact. And, and this is the powerful DSL portion of this whole, uh, whole thing that you can say, hey, you know, I have this pact with this uh, given user A exists and is not an administrator upon receiving a request for user A, with request gets, you know, the user's user A will respond with a 200 and body expected. So you define the path, the DSL uh, pact here. And uh, so it's usually given, uh, given to define the setup criteria for the provider. And, uh, and uh, you know, so basically you can, you can actually uh, create reports out of this. And, uh, and this mock service, you know, basically you send up this mock service and you can run your uh, APIs against it. It's, it's pretty neat. Uh, there's more examples in the links on my PowerPoint, which you can later uh, check. Uh, so, oh, but I'm going back to end-to-end -end testing. So, again, a lot of people ask, will ask, you know, okay, I actually have this, actually I'm testing this, right? I'm actually testing the end-to-end -end test. Well, yes, you probably are testing a lot of the end-to-end, -end, uh, doing a lot of end-to-end -end testing, actually maybe covering a lot of these use cases or uh, problems that might arise. But however, unlike con uh, unlike contract, contract testing, end-to-end uh, -end testing requires all that box. You remember Martin Fowler's image there? It actually requires everything there to be online or maybe set up in some way, right? And subbed out some way. Uh, and uh, because that's why it's called end-to-end -end, end -end testing, right? Uh, so it requires a lot of uh, time, effort, and maintenance to actually go through and set up an end-to-end -end test in a switch environment. Uh, so, ooh. <laughs> So end-to-end -end test small, uh, also causes smaller bugs to actually hide behind bigger bugs. So if you have an issue, uh, you might not actually find the rest of the issues until you fix the one, one big issue there, out there in, the, you know, in your face. Uh, and uh, another thing is that end-to-end -end tests kind of are flicky. And uh, the thing is this, on, like, there's a lot of tools that actually make life better, but they're not all perfect. Uh, so, you know. Uh, that's another problem with end-to-end -end testing, and it takes, as I said before, it takes a lot of time to run. Uh, so there's another tool out there called VCRPy, and uh, VCRPy allows you to actually record a, a uh, you know, a response. But the problem with uh, with VCRPy is that you have to actually have both services uh, up and running. Uh, so you have to have a provider, you have to have a consumer, and you have to actually, you know, record those responses and then play replay them back. Uh, it's a pretty nifty tool, don't get me wrong, uh, and if you want to go this way, you can use it. Uh, but with Pact, actually, you, can't, you don't actually need that consumer or provider to be online and, and ready. You can actually start defining your contract early on, and you actually can uh, run your test against that contract. Uh, so another nice thing about uh, Pact is that it actually, unlike VCR, it actually gives you a um, given a request for will return, right? There's a, uh, there's a nice, Almost like documentation uh, that you can use and you know uh, make sure you reuse in the end. Um, so another thing is that you know uh, with, with you can actually with pack you can actually start with uh, create these pack brokers. 
that allows you to understand the relationship between your microservices, and uh, that helps a lot, especially if you have like more than one microservice, like at least six, seven, right? <laughs> After a while, it gets kind of crazy. Uh, so this actually allows you to understand what's the relationship between, between your microservices, which is not available with uh, BCR by. Uh, and uh, so, yeah. So there are things that people are saying, okay, hey, I have Swagger. I, have, I use Open API, and, uh, and I use all the specifications to test my API. Well, you remember the first slide where you had two different teams working on their own little tests? So actually, that's, that's what was happening with them, right? They each one created their own little Swagger API, uh, you know, uh, specifications, and only tested it against uh, against their own API. Uh, and they didn't really uh, test the responses that would be expected or anything like that. Um, I mean, this is still good, uh, definitely. Uh, do continue if you're using Swagger API. Do definitely go uh, continue using it. Uh, but as I said before, you know, uh, it doesn't actually cover all the uh, problems that you might face. Uh, Okay, so summary. When you get out here, I just want to make sure that you have a couple points, and then you you you, uh, you remember these. Uh, so, first of all, if you do contract tests that solve all your problems, uh, and maybe if you do contract testing, you don't need any other testing. No, that's that's not it. <laughs> definitely continue to do uh, unit testing. Uh, definitely do continue to do end-to-end -end testing. Uh, you know, each have its has its uh, you know uses use cases. Uh, however, contract testing is a um, basically allows you to do very fast testing against your API or microservice and make sure that you know uh, contracts are or contracts are satisfied right making sure that uh, when two teams are working on the same uh, different, different microservices they don't break each other's stuff uh, so yeah uh, so the benefits again are it's faster than each and ten tests it verifies interactions at the boundary of external service you won't need both the provider and the consumer to be online so you can actually have a like a quick uh, into integration uh, pipeline where one one portion it does a contract test and you have faster feedback and that way you know maybe for maybe you can hook this up to pull requests which is you know which might actually take uh, less time uh, so and then the thing is this this, this contract uh, mentality can actually continue allow you to uh, continue uh, allow ongoing or facility ongoing communication between silo teams so if you have a couple teams out there. Uh, either ge geographically or uh, maybe because of you know requirement, uh, this this contract and establishing this contract and sharing this contract from a single source will definitely help out uh, facilitate that communication and make sure that you know people talk to each other. Um, so yeah, that's my time I think at this point. Uh, so I, I have some sources here as I said. Uh, so these two last links are uh, Martin from Martin Fowler's uh, you know uh, website. Definitely check it out. He has awesome. Uh, Information there, uh, and then uh, I put also uh, like Pact.io, Python Pact uh, links, and also uh, Pact actually has a Docker image that you can just deploy and uh, have a service up and running and start running your API tests against it. Um, thank you for your time, and uh, if you want to talk, we can talk later. As I know, in 20 minute sessions we don't have Q and A, so <laughs> thank you very much.